Hi, I'm Mark Horwich from Yale School of Medicine and HHMI. I um, want to continue talking about chaperone-assisted protein folding. Um, in a, uh, a previous part of this talk, um, I've discussed the um, uh, history of chaperones and how they came about as being recognized as components that are crucial to assisting protein folding in the cell. Uh, and talked specifically about the HSP60 and HSP70 class chaperones and how they uh, use different architectures to recognize uh, hydrophobic surfaces exposed in uh, uh, respectively extended segments of, uh, in the case of HSP70, uh, and uh, exposed surfaces and collapsed uh, polypeptides in the case of uh, the chaperone and ring assemblies. Uh, and I uh, summarized uh, toward the end of uh, that discussion the role of HSP70s uh, in assisting uh, proteins leaving uh, the ribosome and transiting membranes uh, of the ER and mitochondria. Talked about final folding by chaperonins in the mitochondrial matrix and out in the eukaryotic cytosol. Uh, and briefly referred to ER folding and components involved in that process. Uh, as well as to the HSP90 components uh, in the eukaryotic cytosol. And so now I'd like to just take up a little bit of detail concerning the, the, uh, those latter uh, and talk uh, additionally about um, uh, the uh, transcriptional uh, response that turns on these effectors under stress conditions, uh, as well as the, their role uh, potentially in neurodegenerative disease. So uh, this is um, a diagram of import and folding as it occurs in the ER, where um, again there is the availing of um, uh, glycosylation and of disulfide bond formation. So the ER is a relatively oxidizing compartment as compared to the cytosol, uh, and disulfide bond formation is crucial to driving productive folding and stabilizing uh, native states that are formed. Uh, and is crucial for ultimately a quality control that allows a properly folded protein to exit the ER and go out the secretory pathway. Uh, and so in this uh, review from Elgard and Hellenius, um, a, a variety of, of different mechanisms are uh, very nicely summarized. So a protein is imported from the cytosol and uh, is glycosylated uh, fairly early on in, during import, even co-translationally. Uh, and the addition of glycans essentially effectively recruits uh, a newly imported uh, non-native protein to the uh, calnexin or calreticulin um, uh, lectins, which bind directly to the glycan that's been added to the polypeptide chain, may also be able to recognize hydrophobic surfaces in the non-native protein. Uh, and has associated with it a oxidoreductase called uh, ERP57. So a protein that has, um, I should say, that has a single glucose on it because there is a glucosidase step that precedes uh, the recruitment to calnexin. One starts initially with three glucoses on the uh, uh, glycan, but hydrolysis down to a single glucose recruits to calnexin or calreticulin. And so at this locus, disulfide bond formation occurs, some folding occurs, but ultimately there is a glucosidase final step where the last glucose is hydrolyzed and that releases the polypeptide from this lectin. Uh, it has some choices at that point. If it's properly folded, it's going to exit the ER. If it's not properly folded, then what would happen in the short term is it is bound by what is a, a really bona fide chaperone that sees hydrophobic sequences uh, of non-native proteins in the e ER, a UDP uh, glucosyl transferase uh, discovered by Armando Perotti some years ago, that now takes this non-glucosylated uh, glycan, puts a glucose back on it, and essentially allows it to recycle to calreticulin or calnexin. So in a sense, this is a sensor that sees non-native states once again by exposed hydrophobic surfaces. Uh, it'll be delightful to ultimately see what the structure of this component looks like. Um, now I should say that one can cycle here uh, for a while, but ultimately there is a timer that will knock off 
this last manos that's uh, positioned on the antenna structure here, this manos, when it's cleaved by alpha-1,2 manosidase 1, is essentially a ticket that says, take me out of the ER and degrade me in the cytosol. And so a host of components, including EDEM, recognized um, uh, in Japan some years ago, as well as other components, uh, are involved with recognizing this uh, demanosed uh, de chain and ticketing it for ERAD, basically. So it will ultimately wind up degraded by the proteasome in the cytosol. So in this system, uh, we're seeing the use of glycans. The presence of disulfide bond formation is driving folding. Uh, and a quality control system that ultimately leads to degradation if a protein can't fold. Uh, and so it embodies a lot of the same principles uh, that are employed in the cytosol, but through a, uh, what's a really novel, entirely different system. Uh, HSP90 is essentially a dimer that's dimerized through its C-terminus. Uh, it's sort of a clamp-shaped structure for which we actually do have now some beautiful X-ray structures. Uh, and um, that clamp closes ultimately on a client protein prior to release of that client protein in some sort of a folded form. Now many of the uh, substrates for HSP90 are proteins that are not truly unfolded or misfolded proteins, but rather are proteins that are near the native state, like steroid receptors, for example, the glucocorticoid receptor, for example, or uh, kinases uh, that have reached a, a nearly native state, but are waiting for particular ligands to come along to ultimately allow them to progress to the native state. Now, how all this works uh, is not entirely clear at this point in the face of what is a very complicated uh, cycle of inners of co-chaperones uh, with the HSP90 system, but there is increasing structural and functional information that may ultimately uh, give us a clear um, uh, atomic level uh, resolution view of what's going on. But just in the broadest of brush strokes, um, there's a cycle, and once again, it involves ATP and involves non native proteins. <clears throat> and in this case, the non native protein or so-called client, as this field prefers to uh, uh, label its substrates, starts out on an HSP70 chaperone in the cytosol and is effectively delivered to HSP90 via a component called HOP that has a bunch of alpha helical TPR domains in it. And HOP can simultaneously interact asymmetrically with an HSP90 subunit and interact with the uh, EVVD uh, terminal domain of HSP70 to recruit a client basically to uh, HSP90. Uh, ATP ultimately arrives at HSP90 and binds to its N-terminal domains during this cycle, and so does a peptidylprolyl isomerase with a TPR domain gets bound asymmetrically. So subsequently to this asymmetric complex, one essentially with the arrival of a component called P23 loses HSP70 and HOP and winds up with a more symmetric complex that is effectively a closed clamp where P23 is bound over the nucleotide pocket and effectively clamps this thing in a stable state. This is a crystal structure from Lawrence Pearl's group some years ago. And finally, there's a release step associated with hydrolysis. But exactly how substrates are bound, whether there's a clear hydrophobic binding pocket, really remains to be seen. Um, there's a great deal of interesting work uh, ongoing with this component. So um, uh, I hate to leave it at that because I think we'll know a lot more over the next couple of years. Finally, I want to comment on cytosolic small HSPs. They've appeared nowhere in the figures that I've shown you, but they're ubiquitous. Sm so small heat shock proteins reside in the cytosol. Some of them are in, in, uh, present inside mitochondria. Uh, their uh, function is largely as a sort of depot for stressed proteins. So these are assemblies that have varying numbers of, of uh, monomers that comprise their oligomeric structure. And non-native proteins exposing hydrophobic surface under stress conditions 
are bound to these small heat shock proteins that themselves undergo small conformational changes that expose hydrophobic surfaces that are normally buried in them. So they themselves become suddenly able under, for example, heat shock conditions to bind non-native proteins and sequester them, as best we know, on their surfaces. Here also molecular details are somewhat lacking. Uh, we have some structural information, but we have yet to see uh, a high resolution structure of a non-native protein, for example, bound to a small HSP. But they occupy this surface during stress conditions, and the idea is that once the uh, stress conditions abate, the non-native protein is released from the surface and is then uh, able to be bound by other chaperones, which can help it find its way back to the native state. Uh, included is the HSP70 class of chaperones, but also HSP100 chaperones, which I haven't really referred to, that are sort of unfoldases, if you will. Um, they include the famous uh, heat shock protein HSP104 that Susan Lindquist and others have studied uh, that's capable of disaggregating proteins in yeast. Uh, and they function generally as uh, sort of triple A plus unfoldases that can unfold a protein and in this case give it a chance to refold to its native state. Okay, well I've talked about the effectors, uh, the proteins that function as chaperones that assist protein folding, but they reside in a circuit that effectively allows them to help the cell under stress conditions. Uh, and so um, the original observations uh, uh, date back to the 70s when uh, Tissiers and his co-workers in a famous paper in Cell noticed that there was a, uh, a huge um, uh, expansion of transcription in a, a salivary puff at the position of HSP70 coding sequence uh, in Drosophila under heat shock conditions. Uh, the idea being that uh, HSP70 becomes highly induced for transcription and that this is protective to the cell uh, under heat shock conditions. Uh, and so um, this is a, a universal type of stress response in all kingdoms, uh, not just Drosophila, that heat or chemical exposure, uh, protein misfolding, uh, drive transcriptional upregulation of specific sets of chaperones and response genes. Uh, and we, we can think of the chaperones as being effectors in this particular system. So um, I want to just give you two examples of this kind of effector system. Uh, one is the well-studied uh, bacterial sigma-32 system that's sort of a thermometer that recognizes uh, heat stress uh, and responds by upregulating uh, the, expre the transcriptional expression of the chaperone genes. And the way this works, as best we understand at this point, is that under basal conditions, the sigma-32 uh, transcription uh, cofactor subunit uh, is associated with a variety of molecular chaperones, with DNA-K and DNA-J, for example. But under stress conditions, where those chaperones become recruited to non-native proteins to try to assist them to maintain a native structure, the sigma-32 is essentially abandoned and left on its own. And what it can do under those conditions is associate with the core polymerase complex and now specifically recognizes sequences that are upstream, that are sigma-32 binding sequences upstream of the uh, coding sequences for uh, such heat shock genes as DNA-K, DNA-J, uh, GRPE, and the GROW-ES and GROW-EL uh, uh, operon. And so this uh, in turn upregulates these chaperones under stress conditions. Uh, in the eukaryotic uh, system, the uh, factor known as uh, heat shock factor one is a transcription factor that normally trimerizes in its active form uh, and binds to specific sequences likewise upstream of a large number of genes, not just heat shock genes, but quite a number of genes as uh, uh, some informatics studies of several years ago have shown. Uh, and here the mechanism for activation is not quite as, as uh, direct and clear. Um, certainly there is one mechanism that resembles that which I just uh, referred to, 
wherein HSP90 associates with HSF1 under basal conditions and then under heat shock conditions in the presence of unfolded proteins that can bind to HSP90, the HSF is liberated to now uh, trimerize uh, in the nucleus and bind to respective sites. But there are some other models that are operative. Um, one involves a thermally sensitive RNA that may associate with EEF1A. The mechanism here is not entirely elucidated, but that thermally sensitive RNA, uh, its presence or exposure to uh, thermal stress ultimately results in the ability of a latent form of HSF monomer to proceed to make active trimers. Um, a further uh, possibility is that HSF itself has the ability, an intrinsic ability, to uh, homotrimerize when exposed to heat. And finally, from experiments that have been carried out recently in C. elegans, it seems possible that there's neural control through networks that are not very well understood as yet, but particular thermosensory neurons that ultimately lead to activation of HSF. So mechanistically, some more work will uh, need to follow to understand such a mechanism and whether such a mechanism uh, applies to uh, a, a mammalian system, for example. So finally, I want to close by just commenting a little bit on um, neurodegenerative disease. Um, here um, we have, a despite molecular chaperones, we have a collective of particular proteins in neurons that can uh, go ahead and uh, misfold and aggregate and produce uh, devastating neurodegenerative conditions. So for reasons that are not understandable, molecular chaperones are not able to prevent these specific proteins that are associated with some of these specific diseases. For example, alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease, the prion protein uh, in uh, PRP disease, mad cow disease, uh, the A-beta peptide, which really has no weight, it has no native state, it's kind of an oddball in that respect. If wherever A-beta pe peptide is made, it's going to misfold there, since there is no correct fold for it. Uh, in ALS, a variety of proteins have now been implicated, including SOD1, TDP43, FUS, a number of other proteins. In Huntington disease, the HTT protein. Um, these proteins go on to misfold despite the presence of molecular chaperones in uh, the variety of cellular compartments. And so the basis to this really remains a mystery at this point. Um, one thing that it seems to be increasingly noticed is that there's a rather poor response to heat shock in neurons. Uh, in fact, neurons that have now been uh, subjected to transcriptional analysis in the setting of these diseases often show no upregulation of heat shock proteins, even in the setting where there's wholesale aggregation uh, occurring inside of the neurons. So why is there no good heat shock response uh, in neurons? We need to understand that. Could we turn it on? Can we overexpress molecular chaperones uh, to assist in the setting of these diseases? Uh, and moreover, why are these particular proteins uh, toxic and why are they tissue specific in their toxicity? For example, why is SOD1, for example, that's implicated in um, some forms of ALS, specifically toxic to motor neurons and not toxic to other neuronal types? Uh, why, for example, is alpha-synuclein also a cytosolic protein? Uh, fairly ubiquitously expressed, particularly toxic to uh, 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 basal ganglion cells uh, in Parkinson's disease, to nigrostriatal cells. Um, I don't think we currently have answers to these uh, questions, uh, but one hypothesis that seems possible is that um, there are particular uh, arrays of channels and receptors uh, and or other molecules within uh, the context of each of these types of neurons uh, that dispose them to particular toxicity from the individual misfolded protein. So for example, you could think that maybe SOD disturbs particular uh, receptors or channels uh, in motor neurons um, and or because of the length of motor neurons and its ability to traverse the long axons of these neurons, uh, it has a special toxicity uh, to long axons. But I think these are all open questions that really remain to be addressed.
Um, and I think both the protein field, the protein folding field, but also the field of workers in the area of neurobiology and neurodegeneration will learn a great deal about uh, these questions in the next few years. And hopefully this will result potentially in new therapies for uh, what's a really uh, devastating set of uh, clinical conditions. Thanks very much.